Ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to start the young man's power class. I'm back again temporarily. Lane is out this morning, so I'll uh, read part of his script. He'll always tell you about the songs. <clears throat> The first song we're going to do is uh, in the uh, front cover of the uh, hymnal, uh, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Uh, this is, what a great hymn this is to start the new year, Bill. <clears throat> we miss you know, those two Sundays. Today is the first Sunday of the Fittering. It's the uh, Lane is away this weekend in Nashville, Tennessee, he called me. <clears throat> and they'll be back next week, praise the Lord. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, again, the, the first song we're going to do is uh, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
favorite song <clears throat> at last is uh, 196. Oh God, our help in ages past. <clears throat> talked already about a lot of changes for the day, and so if you will, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, this day we pray you would guide us through changes, changes from one season to another, from one year to another, changes from one Bible study to another. Enable us not to flee from your presence nor deny the leading of your Holy Spirit. For those who battle diseases, may you intercede through doctor's care, medication, and prayer. For those, for those who wage war with either, with either with purpose or with its ending, um, may you help and intercede uh, those through careful listening, attentive presence, and prayer. Just as we leave the focus of Advent, change in the seasons, and embrace the new year, soon the journey of Lent, be with us in all that we do in your will. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. Thank you, John. That was great. Um, 
Do we have any announcements? We have one. Yeah. Here you are. Yes, sir. Don't stand over here because my voice is uh, pretty rough this morning. Hopefully, you can hear this. It's a mine. Hope that's a little better. Uh, what I have to report is the sad news that Barry Reed one of our very long time members passed away yesterday. Um, Barry was one of the ones who introduced me here a, a lifetime ago and uh, a very good friend. Um, Barry is going to, uh, uh, the funeral for Barry is going to be out at Wellspring. The time hasn't been determined yet, but uh, it won't be, won't be too long. Thank you, Bill. I want to thank all of you for the privilege of being your president. I hope I'll do a good job. I will do my best. If any of you have any criticism or suggestions, I welcome them. Any more announcements? Well, let me tell you about these two old friends of mine, Willie and Clarence. They were both 91 years old and both grew up together. They played baseball and little league, pony league, even through high school. And Willie was a little sick, so Clarence spent every day with him. They were both in a nursing home. And Clarence said, you know, Willie, I wonder if they played baseball in heaven. Willie said, I don't know. And Clarence said, well, you know, you're probably going to go before me, so if, if, any way you could tell me, I would appreciate it. <laughs> so sure enough, Willie died. And it was about three weeks later, Clarence heard this big clap of thunder. He said, Clarence, Clarence? Clarence said, who's that? This is Willie. He said, Willie, you dead. He said, I know, but you wanted to know about baseball in heaven. And I've got some good news and bad news. He said, Well, what's the good news? He said, Well, the good news is we play baseball every day. And it's fantastic. Just a fine field, great people. And I tell you, you never get tired. Well, he said, well, that's good. He said, how about, what was the bad news? He said, well, the bad news is you're pitching next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> this morning, Sandy's going to lead us in something I think is fascinating, which will be different religions other than Christianity. You know, I have several Muslim friends and a lot of Jewish friends. And to know more about them is a good thing. Because then we understand each other better. And then we can be good neighbors. Sandy. Thank you. Good morning. It's so nice to see such a big crowd this morning. That's terrific. I hope everybody had a good holiday. Happy New Year. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to the Young Men's Bible Class, uh, not only for having me here again, but also for your very generous Christmas gift, which arrived in my mail shortly uh, before the holiday. Uh, it was very generous, and I thank you for that. On to 2024. I want to undertake these next couple of months, and I do mean months, um, what we sometimes call the Abrahamic religions, traditions. Traditions that trace their roots back in some way to the great father or to the exalted father, and that is what the word Abraham means in Hebrew. Ab is father. And then you add this sort of uh, honorific on it that means great father or exalted father. To start, I want to break it down a little bit. 
almost 56% of the world's population are part of a tradition that traces its roots back to Abraham. Almost 56% of the world's population today. There are almost 2.4 billion Christians in the world. That, that number is somewhere in the neighborhood of 31% of the population of the world. There are 1.9 billion Muslims. Let me get that billion and Muslims right. My M's and my B's are getting confused. That's about 25% of the world's population. Islam, by the way, is growing quickly, um, more rapidly than Christianity, and scholars estimate that by 2070, it will be the largest religious tradition in the world. So some of us will, if we're lucky, if I live to be as old as my parents, I'll still be here. But my, uh, your children, grandchildren, most certainly, uh, will see that shift. Jews, by contrast, only number about 15 million, which is 0.2% of the world's population. Uh, that's a drop in the bucket, but it's still an important tradition for us to uh, contemplate for two reasons. Number one, it was the foundation for the Abrahamic religion. And number two, it still plays a significant role in our lives here in the United States because 40% of the Jewish population in the world lives here. 46% lives in Israel and the rest are scattered around the world. Um, now, if we want to be technical about religions that have Abraham as their cornerstone, I would add people like Baha'i or the Druze or even the Rastafarians. But I am not going to get all technical about that. That's too in the weeds. What I'm going to do in these next few weeks is stick to the big three because I think that that will give us plenty to do. And I'm going to do it to make a couple of points. I've already stated one. At 56% of the world's population, this is a significant part of what's going on on our planet. And we need to be aware of how that plays into the contemporary landscape. Number two, we can get into this idea that we are ancestrally related, but there's an issue with that too. I want to give you a couple of examples. Even though we are ancestrally related, whether that be technically or spiritually, Relationship can sometimes mask our diversity. And I want us to be aware that this is a diverse population of people. I'll give you a simple example. Any parent will tell you, I raised these kids in the same house doing the same things, and they're very different kids. Different personalities, different ways of being, different interests and, and, and lifestyles. So yeah, we know that on a family level, you can have real differences even between siblings. One of the TV shows I like, I don't know if any of you watch it, it's Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates. So <laughs> I've got a few PBS fans up here in the corner. Um, one of the things that he does that I think is really funny is he does surprise cousins. People you didn't know you were related to. Um, one of my favorite ones was when he had uh, the comedian uh, Larry David on, who is related to Bernie Sanders, who used to fight him on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and they were both like, oh, really? And so it's genetically, you find out that you're related to people you weren't even aware of. And that gives you some sort of a sense of a bond with them, even though you might not know anything about them. When we think about diversity here, we want to think about different cultures, different language systems, different realities, different worldviews. So even though there are ancestors, we want to think about how this group is diverse. And that raises the third point. Conflict is sometimes inevitable. But I want to put a big warning sign on this one. I am not one of those people who is going to blame religion for every conflict in the world. 
In fact, I am one who is going to advocate that religion is most often used by politicians and tyrants and people who have an agenda to rouse people to a point of view rather than the source of the conflict itself. One of the things that I think we just heard a minute ago and is going to be important to remember here is that the more we know about each other, the more we know that we have in common, then maybe the more we can find places of cooperation and peace. And so as an educator, that's one of the most important things for me. All right, so this series, we're going to learn about these traditions, think about what they share. And when I want to begin this, I want to start with Abraham himself so that we have a good, steady foundation from which to understand these commonalities. When you talk about Abraham as the great father, you are talking about a mythic figure. And now I want to be clear, when we use the word myth in religious studies, that doesn't mean, oh, what an urban myth, that's not true. I can't stand here and tell you for certain whether or not a man named Abraham was married to a woman named Sarah, had a nephew named Lot. I don't know. Nobody knows. We have no independent verification of his life outside of what occurs in the book of Genesis, what appears in the Quran, what appears in the New Testament. We have stories about him, but we don't have any what a historian would call historical evidence. I was in Istanbul one time at the Tokaki Palace. Anybody been there? It's a great place to visit. But my favorite thing that day, and I stopped and laughed and laughed about it, was a, a pot, an ancient pot. It was labeled Abraham's saucepan. <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess when he needed a nice bernet, this is what he, this is what he used to whip it up. Um, you know, what they were saying is what scholars say. Abraham is a reflection of, or those stories are a reflection of a time period, the ancestral era, where people like Abraham lived. Whether or not he was actually a human being is less important than to know the kinds of stories that they told about his life and how a family got started is what is central here. We also know that from a literary point of view, these stories read rather symbolically, right down to calling him great father. You know, it's like, okay, he's the father of us all. He's the paradox. One of the things he does is he provides a basis for what we call ideological stories. Stories about how things came to be as they are. How did the Moabites and Ammonites get started? They come from Abraham's nephew, Lot's uh, not so uh, up and up relationships with his daughters after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why do men get circumcised in our community? Because God told Abraham, circumcision is the way to go. So on the one hand, we've got ideological stories that center around Abraham. But on the other hand, we also have something else. Abraham is an exemplar of how God interacts with humankind. And I want to think about him in three ways, centrally. Number one is as a migrant. Number one is as a migrant. The very first thing we find out about Abraham is this. He was told by God, leave your father's house. Leave your country, leave your kin, and go to a place that I will show you. And he takes off, and he goes. And so in the one sense, Abraham is a man who is uprooted and moves from one country to another. He demonstrates in this way something core to all three traditions that follow him. You're going to have to learn how to navigate some important journeys if you're going to survive. He builds 
build up a separate community, a separate thing, but he does it by figuring out how to move among various peoples and groups, sometimes peacefully and sometimes less so, in order to establish his place. Let me give you a couple of examples. There's not one but two stories of Abraham's wife, Sarah, being um, attractive to leaders who uh, wanted to take advantage of her. Abraham and Sarah had to figure that one out. His nephew, Lot, who's traveling with him, is kidnapped, held hostage, and Abraham has to go with some others and get him back in an armed raid. This is not an easy place for him to light. He has to figure out how to locate his home base amongst a bunch of other people who were living there and in situations that were sometimes challenging, like famine. He had to go down to Egypt and live for a while because the environment wasn't suitable for life. In these things, his story resonates with ours because we, while we might not have to move from country to country, also have to be navigators, journeyers, people who go through life in motion. We never know what might be in front of us. And so finding our way in sometimes difficult circumstances is one way that Abraham, as a migrant, creates a storyline that is easy to build on. Right? Second way. Abraham wants to be a family man. And that's a challenge for him too. But in this way, we can also identify with him. Because Abraham knew something that most of us also know. Going through life by yourself is not a good way to go through life. We go through life in units. And those units help us survive. I was reading again last week about how people live longer, healthier lives when they have good, healthy relationships that sustain them. Family, friends, community. Abraham is also an exemplar of that, but it wasn't easy because the first thing he was told was, leave your house, leave your family, leave your father, leave that community. And he had to figure out how to get things started. But Sarah could get pregnant. <clears throat> so one of the first challenges we meet in the Abraham story is how will this story continue if we can't have an heir? Is his heir going to be Lot? No way, because Lot was making one bad decision after another. And they were not getting along all that well. They had to separate out early on. Is his heir going to be Eleazar of Damascus, the steward of his house? Abraham's beginning to think so because he was getting older and there was no child forthcoming. And he's like, God promised me a family and I don't see this happening. Is it going to be Hagar's son, Ishmael? Muslims think so. This is the heir that they trace themselves back through. And so Hagar, Hajira, in the Muslim tradition, is going to be important to that story. And you'll remember, she gets pregnant because she is not the servant of Abraham. She's the servant of Sarah, his wife. And Sarah wants to do a surrogacy, but it didn't work out because the two women weren't getting along real well. So, was it going to be Ishmael? Was it going to be Isaac? the child of his old age, but also a child who God demanded he sacrifice, at least according to Jewish tradition. So this whole thing about how he is going to build a family was a struggle. This is also something we can identify with. Lots of families know what infertility is like and the challenges of infertility. Lots of families know what it is to work through the social and economic forces that work against families. 
We're dealing with that in our country right now. Lots of social and economic forces that make family life very difficult. And also, they had to steer through the dynamics of jealousies and rivalries and all the fun things that we do in our families. We've just had Christmas. I'm sure a few of us are very familiar with that. Right? Because there's always holiday times. How do we steer and navigate difficult family situations? Abraham is also an exemplar here. So he's a journeyer, a migrant. He is a family man. But he's fundamentally the paradigmatic figure for fidelity, trust, or faith. And this is important to all three traditions. Let me, let me do this. First of all, he had faith as a follower of God and of a God who for him can be both quite present and quite elusive at the same time. Right? There are times when God is speaking to him very clearly. Go. Do this. Be there. I'm instructing you in this way. I'm promising you this. And there are times when that God seems very distant from him. Who can identify with that? Secondly, there are, when you think about this God that Abraham is following, it's a God who both makes demands and also holds out visions of what could be. And so in that way, it, all, it puts some responsibility on Abraham. That's going to be important to all three traditions. What is demanded of us if we are to be in these traditions? But also, what is extended? What is the hope? What is the dream? What is the ideal that we are working toward? In this way, Abraham is a paradigm for that. Now, given these three qualities, it's easy to see why he's a good first figure, right? He has a lot of things that say, oh, we can build on this. But is that all that these three traditions have in common? Let me ask you. You've been quiet long enough. <laughs> so now it's, time, now it's time for you to play. If I ask you right now, what are things that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam hold in common, what would you tell me? What was that? God. Okay. I got a good question right here, although June, quite correctly, said Allah. Allah, if you don't know, is just the Arabic word for God. It's not a proper name. And so when we say God in Hebrew, which is Elohim, which can be a proper name, but it's really a word that means God, or we say Allah in Arabic, we are just saying God. And so one of the things that these traditions hold in common is the idea of this God. What else? Obedience. Obedience. That's a great one, Ralph. It's uh, Islam itself comes from the root salam, which one of the thing, what's one of the things that Islam is stressing is submission. You are submitting to God in obedience to God. Whether you follow the law, whether you follow the covenant, whether you follow um, the the direct the dictates of the faith. Obedience is central to all of these. What else? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. That's a fundamental way when you're dealing with these religions. What do they come down to despite their differences? Love your neighbor. Good. What else? Belief in an afterlife. Variable belief in an afterlife. Different ideas of what that afterlife may or may not entail. But even though Abraham, in his generation, did not believe in a hereafter, because that's a later evolution in the Jewish tradition, they believed you lived on through your children, through your line, through your lineage. But we are going to see in Judaism the idea of an afterlife develop. 
It is central to Christianity and it is important to Islam. So those are those are that's another good thing. What else? Take care of the poor. Take care of the poor. A fundamental responsibility. One of the highlights of each religion. We're going to talk about that one. Anything else? What about a place that's important to all three? Anybody? Temple Mount. Temple Mount. Jerusalem. Yeah, the city of Jerusalem. Holiest site in, in Judaism. Very important to Christianity. Third holiest site in Islam. So that's a very important commonality. Now put that on the list. I'm a biblical scholar, or I'm a religious studies scholar, so I'm going to say this. Monotheism. Not just God, but one God. Now, they don't all think about it the same way. You know, Muslims who are strict, strict monotheists think Christians kind of fudge that a bit with our, with our trinity. But nonetheless, monotheism is important to all three religions. Anybody else got anything that they want to add to this list? What was that? Giving back. Giving back to God. Yes, devotion, dedication, putting God above all. They got central to monotheism. I would add this. Prayer, fasting, some of these observance of holidays and creating a calendar around which these, these events are done. Christianity, of course, moves primarily on a solar calendar. Judaism moves on a combination solar lunar calendar and Islam moves on a lunar calendar. But they all three have very specific ways of marking time. So I would add those things. And at least for Christianity and Islam, I would add an emphasis on proselytizing. Why they're the two biggest religions in the world today? Because they're designed to spread. What I intend to do in this series, and this is just an introduction, so um, what I intend to do is to walk through these traditions sequentially. I'm going to talk predominantly about Judaism at first, Predominantly about Christianity in the middle, predominantly about Islam at the end. And I say predominantly because I am always going to be looking for points of connection between the three, all the way along. But at the, what I'm going to hope that you walk away with is a sense of some of the history, the tradition, the knowledge, so that you can have better conversations with your friends who might not see the tradition the same way you do. Those kinds of things I hope are what we'll get. What I want to do today is leave you um, with the thought about Abraham. It's from the late rabbi and writer Jonathan Sachs. I don't know if any of you read any of his books. Uh, he died in 2020 of cancer. Uh, but this is from his book, The Great Partnership, which is really about science, religion, and their relationship. But he has this wonderful bit about Abraham that I want to uh, leave you with today. It's a long quote. Abraham, he says, performed no miracles, commanded no armies, ruled no kingdom, gathered no mass of disciples, and made no spectacular prophecies. It's 100% right. Yet there can be no serious doubt that he is the most influential person who ever lived, counted today as he is, as the spiritual grandfather of more than half of the billions of people on the face of this planet. His immediate descendants, the children of Israel, and you can tell this is written by a rabbi, known today as Jews, are a tiny people numbering less than a fifth of a percent of the population of the world. Yet they outlived the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and Romans. Uh, that was going off for me. The medieval empires of Christianity and Islam, and the regimes of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, all of which opposed Jews, Judaism, or both, and all of which seemed impregnable in their day. They disappeared. The Jewish people lived. 
It is also no less remarkable that the small persecuted sect known as the Christians, who also saw themselves as children of Abraham, would one day become the largest movement of any kind in history of the world, still growing today two centuries after almost every self-respecting European intellectual predicted their faith in the net demise. As for Islam, it spread faster and wider than any religious movement in the lifetime of its founder and endowed the world with imperishable masterpieces of philosophy, poetry, architecture, and art, as well as a faith seemingly immune to secularization or decay. All other civilizations rise and fall, he concludes. The faith of Abraham survives. It's a lot to think about, isn't it? So, with that, anybody got a question? Yes, June. Are you saying that Abraham wasn't a man, but... I June is asking, am I saying Abraham is was Abraham not a man? I am saying, as a scholar, I can't tell you whether Abraham actually existed as a human being. I don't have any independent corroborating evidence, you know, like a birth certificate, <laughs> um, a record from, you know, some government somewhere along the line. I don't have any of those things. It doesn't mean that he didn't live because we wouldn't expect those kinds of records of individuals like that in the time he was living. But does it mean that he is, um, does it mean that he did live? I can't also say that. But what I can say is that no matter what, it's clear he's a symbolic figure. And in that way, he's mythic. Because as great father and all these stories being told about a great father and all these ancestral lines traced back to a grandfather are clearly mythic, mythic lines. This is, you know, this is the progenitor of this people, of this people, of this people. You know, does it technically mean that if we did DNA analysis, we would trace it back? We can't say. But does it mean that there is a symbolic element to it? Yes. And so in that way, we talk about the mythic figures. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, Dennis. Don't we have the same question about Jesus Christ for a lot of people? A lot of people would say the same question about Jesus Christ. You can't independently corroborate it. But, you know, it's a matter of faith that you believe that he walked the face of this earth. Doesn't surprise me that I can't independently corroborate it, and it doesn't mean that I don't believe they were, you know, real people in the time. I'm just saying, when you run up against the arguments that you will run up against in academic literature, you just need to be prepared that for the history of the people of Israel, there's not much you can prove until you get way down later in the monarchy. There's not much independent evidence outside of it. Doesn't, doesn't the uh, New Testament offer some evidence? Of what? Of Abraham's existence. No. It talks about him as, as a spiritual figure. It talks about him as, in fact, Paul uses him as a, an allegory. Uh, that's how Paul uses him. But it doesn't offer any independent evidence. Jesus talks about, oh, at the, at your father Abraham, but he doesn't, you know, provide any, what we would call as, uh, you were a judge, competent evidence, right? What's the competent evidence that demonstrates the point? Well, I said some evidence. Yeah, <laughs> but, you, but you, know, you know what I'm talking about. There's evidence and then there's evidence. <laughs> so what, where do we go? Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Um, you said that in Abraham's time, they believed that a person would live on in your descendants. Yeah. It's a great question. She said, if you live on in your descendants, does that give rise to this concept of corporate personality? Yes. You are part, but there's also something else to it. You're part of a household, a clan. And so this is the hardest thing for us to understand about the ancients, um, particularly when we get to this Jewish layer of things. You weren't thought about as an individual. You were thought about as a member of a household. So you would, if, if you were a member of the household of Abraham, that was where your identity came from. 
and you played a role in that place. And that's how your, your genetics went forward, that's how your life went forward, that's how you carried meaning and value. You were part of that group. And that was your identity. So this sort of very individualism that we have in, a, in, in this country didn't fly there. Wasn't, wasn't the way that they saw it. And you had to have that because you couldn't survive otherwise, right? How were you going to feed yourself? How were you going to clothe yourself? How were you going to protect yourself? You didn't have a police force. You didn't have an army. You had to have all these people to survive. Okay? Anybody else? Well, I hope you're excited about it. Um, we'll start out with some of the Jewish traditions next week. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting, a different kind of ride for us. But uh, pick up uh, Rabbi Sack sometime. Give him a, give him a look. All right, I'll see you next week. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm really excited. Yeah, this is fascinating. And it's a way for us to relate, to expand ourselves become better people, I hope. We bow your heads, please, for the close of prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, please watch over us in the following week. Help us to love and respect all our neighbors and show a friendly attitude towards everyone that we meet. Dear Lord, until we meet again, please hold us in the palm of your hand. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.